I'm just going to say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I ask you to be here today, and I thank you for allowing me to be here today, Lord. Lord, I ask you just to, to speak through me and for our, our guests and our congregation just to have an open heart. It's in your name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> you know, every day a man, he used, to, uh, he used to walk to work, and he would stop by a jewelry store. Now, this was obviously before cell phones and things of that nature, but he would stop in front of the jewelry store, and he'd take out his old pocket watch, and he would set his pocket watch to the big grandfather clock that's in the uh, store window. And he did this every day. And one day, the jewelry store owner just happened to be in the doorway, and he stopped the man, and he said, he said, what do you do that requires such accurate time? I notice you set your uh, watch by my clock every day. And the man looked at him and kind of grinned. He goes, oh, oh, I just work at the plant down the street. And it's my job to blow that five o'clock whistle. And I got to blow that whistle as exactly five o'clock. And the man, the jeweler store, huh, befuddled. You can't do that. You can't do that. The man said, well, why not? He said, you can't, you can't blow that five o'clock whistle off of my clock because I set my clock to that five o'clock whistle. In life, we look to a standard to set things. We set our clocks by a standard. We set our rulers by a standard. We set our thermometers by a standard. We set the tests that are given to our children in schools by a standard. The speed at which we drive is set by a standard. Now, the question is not, do you hold your life to a standard? The question is, to what standard do you hold that life to? As Christians, we hold the Bible as our absolute standard. Paul even wrote about standards. And if you would, if you would turn to Colossians, I'm going to be speaking out of Colossians uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 18. So, so what's actually going on in, in this book? In the previous verse, in verse 17, Paul had just told them to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, who are they? Paul is writing to the uh, people of Colossus. Um, Paul had never actually been there, but the church that was there was started uh, by people that he met, Paul met on his travels, and he had converted in his travels. Now, Paul gets wind that the church there is being uh, infiltrated, if you will, by relativism, and basically paganism and some secular philosophies was coming in. In a nutshell, they were changing the standard. They were trying to put their standard of things into the church. Now, in beginning in verse 18, uh, Paul is going to give the standard for what it means to do this or to do this, how we are to do life, how we are to do marriage, how we're to do family, and how we are to do work. Everything we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now again, starting in Colossians 3, verse 18, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as fitting in the Lord. Some translations would even say to be subject to. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Some translation says embittered against. It also goes into children. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Some translations even says, do not exasperate your children. Now, when it comes to wives, be subject to your husbands. I know this is not a popular phrase in our culture in our today's times. I understand that. Our world views puts this context to be subject to or submit to in a negative light. In our day, the, the be subject to or to submit yourself to is a not going to happen concept. It just ain't going to happen. I'm not going to submit to nobody. I'm not going to be subject to no one, especially based off just because I'm married to them. 
But the Bible uses this concept very differently. The Bible uses this exact concept to describe Jesus' attitude towards his heavenly father. John 6, 38, it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now understand something very, very, very important here. To be subject to, to submit to, does not mean inferior. Jesus Christ is equal to God the Father. They are the same power. They are the same status. The phrase does not mean less of. It does not mean some assessment of ability. It does not mean a quality factor. It does not mean a talent. It does not mean a skill. It is talking about just sheer order of things. When it says, wives, be subject to your husbands, it is meaning husbands are be, to be the, the head of the home. Ladies, please, please don't get mad at me because uh, my boy will be right. Um, but I did not make it up. I'm not interpreting it weird. Uh, it is right here in the Bible. Um, wives, be subject to your husbands. Now, if you're saying, if you're saying, well, okay. He's the head, but I'm the neck. If you could play the video. This is where he thought it, my boy thought it was going to get controversial. Um, that is from the, the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. There's only two reasons I, I, I've come to realize in, in what Bobby calls my uh, sanctified imagination. If you feel that you are the neck and you control the head, then that means that you are not submitting like the Bible instructs you. Or it could be. It could be that your husband isn't doing what he needs to be doing. Husbands, hear me out on here, out here. And I need you to listen carefully because men, we mess it up. We mess it up tremendously. This is not saying husbands, you got to make your wives be subject to you. It does not say that. The grammar is very clear. Wives are chose to choose to be subject to their husbands. It's a voluntary act. It cannot be forced. When guys read stuff in the Bible like the man is the head, well, they immediately go to I'm the boss mode. I'm the boss. And God said, I made them male and female. I gave them together as a married couple dominion together and not him in dominion over her and not her in dominion over him. It means you both are one. And it's the husband is firstly responsible, firstly responsible for the marriage and the family. She is also responsible. Everyone should also understand because it's critical to be subject to is not the same thing as obedience. Subject to does not mean to blindly follow. Subject to has its limits. Obedience is not commanded in this of the wife. There is a limit to this command, and that limit is as is fitting in the Lord. There are two ways to understand this phrase. The wife is to be subject to the husband because it was fitting for Christ to be subject to the Lord God. And if it is fitting for Christ to be subject to the Lord God, it should be fitting for the wife to be subject to the husband. I don't have a... I don't have a fancy little catchphrase that applies here, so I'm going to use Bobby's. Y'all all right? Now, there's another way to understand this. The wife is to be subject to the husband only into the things that is fitting in the Lord. When the husband commands things that are not fitting in the Lord, then the wife is not subject to it. If the husband goes off into some activity or task that is not fitting in the Lord... The wife is not subject. It is only if it's fitting in the Lord. 
If your husband wants, hey, let's go rob a bank, you going with them? No. No, you're not. You shouldn't. Both of these ways of understanding are true. Both are useful. Both are supportive throughout the Bible. To be, this be subject to household standard is unusual for its time. It is not the way other household standards worked in that day. The other household standards of that time told the wife to be subject to. Other household standards of that time told the husbands to force their wives, and it did not place any limits on the husband as to how he made his wife obey. This standard of subject to is very different for this. Another difference in the household gives an instructions again to the husband, firstly responsible. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. No, one, no other instructions of that time told the husbands to love their wives. It was not even suggested that the husband do this. Now this love here is not an affection towards, it's not a desire. I desire my wife, so there, therefore I must love her. No, this is an agape love. It is a sacrificial love. It is an unconditional love. This is a love that will cause the husband to sacrifice himself for his wife. His own wishes are for her well-being, putting her above himself. In Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wife, wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That is what we're talking about here. Husbands, be willing to give yourselves up. Christ loved the church unconditionally. It was not based on the church's performance. It was not based on the church's ability or skills. It was not based on any of that. Jesus loved the church sacrificially. He died for the church. He died so that we could have eternal life. Now, husbands need to be reminded of this concept far more then wives need to be reminded of subject two. And the reason I say that is because I know I do. Wives can more easily do their part if husbands do their part. And guess what? Husbands can more easily do their part if wives do their part. But did you notice there's an additional standard to the husbands? Husbands is the head. Husbands is firstly responsible. There is a lot of standards here that is geared towards the husband. Did you notice there's an additional standard? And that standard, and do not be embittered against them. Paul is limiting the bad behavior of the household here. Bitterness. Bitterness is a strong emotion. That emotion can result in coldness. It can re rudeness, harshness. Uh, sharp and resentful, it can lead to abuse and brutality. The concept to not be embittered against a wife should change your life, and it should change your life right now. Can, can, let me just be transparent here. Most of the issues that's in my household isn't because uh, Deanne submits herself to me. It's because I get, to, I get doing things and I forget, get too busy, and I forget about that old sacrificial love that I'm supposed to have. And let me tell you about when the Air Force sent me away for months on end. And who was at home handling everything? She was. And they sent me here and there. She was handling everything. And when I come back, guess what? Honey, it's not done to my standard. And I'm embittered against her. You might be saying, man, Tucker, you get a pass on this one. You get a pass. You were supporting the country. No, I do not. I do not get a pass. I do not get a pass. And you don't either. It is not my standard or your standard. It is his standard. Husbands, you cannot bail on your responsibilities to lead the family. I understand that in life, there's seasons of our lives that, that would prevent you. There, there's sickness and there's, there's things of this nature uh, that might prevent you in a season. But I'm talking about capable men and capable wives. Men, you cannot 
you cannot bail. Men, I want you to ask yourself right now, am I purposefully, am I consistently, intentionally discipling my wife and my children? You cannot say I'm busy. You cannot say I got a job or a business to run. You cannot say uh, you're in charge of the kids. You cannot say you're in charge of the house. Here, wife, you run everything. You cannot say you be the pastor of our family. You can't. And don't just think, again, don't just think this love that I'm talking about is affection and desire towards your wife. If, if you're thinking that and you think all is good, it's not. When I'm able to love my wife sacrificially and not be embittered against her, it changes everything about me. It changes the way I interact with her. It changes how I interact with my children. It changes how I interact with people in my life. It changes how I interact with, with my boss. It changes everything. At best, at best, what, what, what happens here? What happens here? At best, we're 80-20. We're 80-20. I'm 80-20. I'm probably 75. Get it right 75% of the time, 25% of the time. But at best. And I'm going to say, knowing you guys, you're 90-10. But what happens here, we start focusing on that 10% or that 20%. And we fail to realize that 80% that they're trying their best. And, and, and just like that song that Jay sang. We forget we are better when just like that song says. Only way we will last forever is if we stay broken together. Remember we're broken together. Now it also goes into children. 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 Be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. Notice that the lo uh, notice here that children are to be obedient. You're 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 required to, and and I'm gonna I'm focusing right here. You are required to be obedient to your fam or your parents. Obedience is not commanded of the wife, but it is for the children. <clears throat> Now, the hard part of this standard for children is that very last phrase. Being obedient isn't that bad. It's that part that says in all things that will get you. This does not mean to be obedient when it is convenient. It does not mean when you feel like it or when obedience or parents are just looking at you. They're looking at me, so I better, I better march in step. Disobedience to the parents is actually rebellion against God. Exodus 20, 12, one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land and which the Lord your God is giving you. Now, did you know Jesus, he set the ultimate example of obedience? He was, if you would, God came in the flesh in Luke 2, 51. And he went down and with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them and his mother kept all these things in her heart. He was obedient to his earthly family, parents, and he was obedient to his heavenly father. But again, there is a standard in obedience that is directed towards the fathers. Fathers do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Fathers, you should not presume upon obedience by continual agitation of your children. By unreasonable demands. I get this one wrong. More often than I'd like to admit. Because I come in what I call military mode. I come in on them pretty hot and heavy, if you will. And I give some of demands that would apply to me as a grown man not to a child <clears throat> Ephesians 6 4 and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath but bring them up in training and uh, admonition of the Lord we have this concept throughout the Bible notice that the stress of the standard is directed on the father 
and it is his duty and responsibility. This is in direct contrast again to the household standards of its day. Roman household standards uh, at that time gave, un again, unlimited authority to the, to the father. He could do anything to make that child obey. He could stress them out. Now, hear me out. Children in the Bible are not given to you parents or to me parents uh, for the benefit of me. They're not. They're not my servants. They're not my slaves. They or we are ordained. We or are ordained for the benefit of the child. I think uh, maybe an all right would go well here. You are the pastor of your family. The reason for this standard to not exasperate your children is simple. It is simple. Paul states it right here. So they will not lose heart. If a father is unjust or too severe, he will provoke his children into bitterness. Bitterness produces discouragement. Discouragement can lead to permanent hostility. There is no place in the Christian home for this. We are supposed to be united together. United as a family, working for the same goals, striving for the same things. A Christian home is marked by unity. Now, all of these standards that I'm giving to you here are, are basically instructions. And instructions can sometimes be uh, hard to understand. They can be confusing. And, and I'm going to give you an illustration here. Uh, migratory birds in the United States, they used to be tagged on the leg with this tag. And that tag read, wash, bile, serve. It stood for Washington Biological Survey. The code was changed after a farmer wrote the Department of Interior. And this is what the letter said. Dear sirs, I shot one of your crows. My wife followed the cooking instructions attached to it. She washed it. She boiled it. And then she then served it. The letter ended with, it was the worst thing we ever ate. Sometimes we misread or we misunderstand instructions. Other times we understand them, we just don't want to do them. Could it be, could it be that we're living in the time of judges, that we don't have a king and we want to put our own standards and our own will upon things, but in reality we do have a king and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I apologize for always playing with my ears. Uh, but this thing, I got a big pumpkin, so it flops everywhere. Paul's instructions or standards for the family are very clear. They are very simple. They are very easy to understand. And I know, I know, and I know because I fall short. They're hard to live by. We struggle with them. But know this, God is such a loving God, we can be certain he will give us more chances to get it right. He even gives us chances in, to practice it at work. In Colossians 3.22, it states, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the, not according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Now, this is talking about slaves and masters. In our days, it can be applied to employee and employer. Obedience in this case is to, in this case is to be with sincerity of heart, not just to what makes the boss happy. We are always going to have work to do. We have a choice. Can we do it for God or do we do it just to please people? As Christians, our first duty is to please God. <clears throat> we do this best when we're not chasing recognition of men. You know, one way that we might try to impress a, a, a boss is actually, in truth, one of the ways we may dishonor God. We are striving, we strive to please him. Now think about this. Some things that men want us to do are not necessarily good. Ephesians 6, 7 says, With good will doing good service as to the Lord and not to men. Understand this concept to us to be better and healthier attitudes towards the work that we have to do every day. 
Colossians 3, 24, knowing that, the, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Now look, you may have a boss with whom you think you work for. But what's being pointed out here, that who you truly work for is the Lord Jesus Christ. This standard says that God is the source of rewards. God is the source of rewards. In ancient times, slaves had no inheritance rights. But in Christ, we all have an inheritance. God is going to reward those that love, worship, and serve him, Ephesians 6, 8. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's slave or free. Now, sometimes we can start to feel like there is very little to look forward to in this, in this life on this earth. Now, perhaps we may receive some small material things. Um, my office here is slam full of memorabilia and awards that I got when I was in the military. And at the time, oh my gosh, this is great. But in reality, it's small. It's small because I know the reward that I am going to get from him up above. It's not permanent, but what Lord gives, Paul points out the fact that our reward as Christians are spiritual, they're heavenly, and they are eternal. And such rewards cannot be taken away. And what I mean by this is the real master, the real boss, he will pay us what really, really, truly matters. Now going on into Colossians 3.25. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he done. And you serve the Lord Christ. This standard uh, that states that the consequences are impartial. Consequences are impartial. This command starts out as it's directed towards the slave. It means if the slave does wrong, consequences. But the master does wrong, he will not be excused. This is because God is impartial to respect to persons, Ephesians 6, 9. And you masters do the same things to them. Giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. This is a stunning concept. Why is it stunning? Because men, women, people, humans, they show partiality, favors are given, debts are forgiven. Some people are punished more severely than others for the exact same thing. And that's just the world we live in. But God is not impressed. He wasn't impressed that I made senior master sergeant. He wasn't impressed with their social classes. He wasn't impressed with the wealth you may have. Or the power that you have. Or any of those things. God is impartial. And as Christians we should strive to live that way. Impartiality. Now during the late 1700s. There was a, a farmer. A man that appeared to be a farmer. And let me make sure he goes to um, a Baltimore hotel. It's the most one of the best Baltimore hotels of its time. And he goes in there and he tries to rent a room for the night. And the man behind the, the, the key keeper, the bookkeeper or whatever says, go, you cannot have this room. He didn't want his reputation to be tarnished by having an old farmer in there. So the man left and he rented a room down the street. And meanwhile, another man comes in. Did you know who that was? No. Nah. Who? That was Thomas Jefferson. The vice president of the United States. The manager immediately got a courier, sent a letter, said, please come back. Please come back. You don't even have to pay. Thomas Jefferson's uh, response was simple and to the point. I value your good intentions highly. But if you have no place for an American farmer, you have no right to give hospitality to the President of the United States. Moving on into 4.1, Colossians 4.1. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Now, this household standards says, lead with justice and fairness. 
What Paul is saying here is revolutionary. It was world changing. The philosophers of Greece and the laws of Rome said that slaves were property. It would be saying the exact same thing about your car that is in the parking lot right now. That I should treat my car with justice and fairness. Paul, Paul places the relation of the employer and the employee in a different light. Employers are not to cheat their workers. They are to grant workers what is right and what is fair and what is just. And they are to do this because both the employer and the employee serve under God. This household standard says leaders and workers are equal under God. Our conduct is or should be guided and modified, if necessary, modified because God is sovereign over all things. Regardless of how important you think you are, God is above you. He's above all things. This reference to masters, master makes this standard unique to say the least. Again, for that time. If God sees fit to put us Christians in a position of authority, we should strive to lead this way. Now, the Duke of Wellington <clears throat> was taking the Lord's Supper in the parish church. And a very poor old man went up to the aisle to receive communion as well. And when, he, when the poor old man re reached the communion table, he knelt down close beside the Duke, right? Someone came up and touched him, touched the poor old man on the shoulder. And he whispered to him. imagine it something like that he was to rise and he was to wait till the duke was finished the great commander caught the the eye and caught the meaning of that whisper and that touch and before the man could rise the duke grabbed him by the arm to prevent him from uh, rising and the duke whispered but very distinctly said do not move. All are equal here. Any Christian in leadership needs to live by this last phrase. And I'd say any Christian at all should live by this phrase. All are equal here. The truth is we live by some standard. The question is to what standard are we setting our lives by? The household standards can seem to be negative. I don't want to be subject to. I don't know if I can love like that. You really mean I got to obey in all things? I can't cheat nobody? May even seem outdated. In its day, they were strikingly positive. And why do I say they were strikingly positive for the day? Well, you had three groups that were in total control during that time. Three groups. You had husbands who could do anything they wanted to, basically. You had parents who could do anything they wanted to, basically. And you had masters who could do anything they wanted to, basically are given instructions and standards on how to live right along, right beside those people that had no control. Wives, children, and slaves. What a difference Christ makes, right? Some people say this code is outdated and only for that culture. As we have seen, this household standard was not at all like the culture of that day. To claim this household standard does not apply to our time is to misunder misunderstand God's goal for your life. God's go goal for us is not to fit in. 
It is not to climb the social ladder. It is not to build wealth. In reality, it is not actually meant to be comfortable. God's goal for us is to be more like Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Every one of the standards that I mentioned here today is something that Christ did in his life. Just as the wife is told to be subject to her husband, Jesus was subject to the father. Just as the husband was told to love his wife sacrificially, Jesus loved us unconditionally and sacrificially. Just as children are told to obey their parents, Jesus obeyed his heavenly father his, and his earthly parents. Just as the father is told not to exasperate his children, Jesus did not exasperate us with a burdensome yoke. He worked in all he did in serving the one who sent him. He treated everyone with justice and fairness. In reality, this standard only calls us to do one thing. All these standards only call us to do one thing. Everything we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. You want to know? You want to know how we become an upside down church? I know Bobby ended it, but I thought this was fitting. You want to know how we become an upside down church? Trusting that Jesus, that he came in the form of a man, lived a sinless life, and he died on the cross for our sins, for me, for you. And he rose again after three days, and he ascended into heaven, and that he is coming back. If there is anyone in here. I'm closing it out. If there's anyone in here. That has not trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I invite you to come to the altar. Are you all?